message today. I want to talk to you about the importance of applying faith that God has given us to our daily circumstances. I find it uh, appropriate because we have been doing some heavy lifting because Pastor has been preaching with, uh, with, with heavy stuff about the different uh, uh, what visions and all that. So, just to have a break on, on the heavy stuff, let, 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 let's, let's, uh, let's do some uh, light moments there, or some uh, encouragement for a change. But for everyday Christian, faith is the essence of the Christian walk. And unless we learn how to apply it in our daily lives, you will not grow. You will not grow in it. And for whatever God desires for us. And the apostle says, okay, this will be our text for this morning. The apostle Paul says, maybe, uh, you know, it's still debatable if he's the one who wrote it. But let's go with Paul. In Hebrews 11, 6, uh, theologians call this the all of faith of uh, faith, right? This chapter 11. Verse 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him, please God. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You know, one problem with that is word like faith. Most of the time, you know, when they view faith, people will have so many ideas of what it means. So, it gets used in a great variety of ways. So, what we do this morning is to clear this concept of faith in a biblical sense and how it may differ to some common ideas about faith. And why is this important? It is important because our day-to-day -day lives are consist of a walk in faith. And in order to pray to grow from faith to faith, our faith must be exercised on a regular basis. Therefore, we need to look at the many things we are involved in each day and the problems that we come up against and see those as opportunities to exercise our faith. You see, like the magic eye which I just gave you, which we just looked at earlier, faith in some ways is like this. It is somewhat encoded in that 3D pattern, and then if you are trained to look, and you know how to look, Eventually, you will see whatever 3D image is hidden within the pattern. So therefore, our focus has to be right, because before we can see the big picture that I want you to see, you need that focus. And once we see it, there is no doubting that it is what it is. Well, at first, we may look at, you know, like my wife. She keeps looking and then tells me, you know what? I don't do this. It's too hard. But it's natural. Okay? It's natural. And, and, and in fact, some people in this postmodern age, you know, they see there's really no such thing as big pictures, so why look further? There's no point. But Faith is the pattern within the current confusion. And by faith we see what lies beyond the trivial details. For some of you who may not be able, some of you may not be able to see and may not have the patience and, and the practice to identify the 3D image that some of us have identified. But we have to take care Okay? Not to imagine things that they are not. But once we see this bigger picture clearly, and we wonder how did I ever miss that, my hope is we never miss the same mistake again. So what kind of faith picture do you have for your life right 
That's my question. With your family, with your marriage, with your job, your business if you have one, do you know what God's will is for you all these years for that area of your life? If so, then we can begin to apply faith because God's will is for you to prosper in all those areas. So let's start with defining what faith is. That's just the introduction, too long. So in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, okay, the writer gave us a description of what this faith is. Let me read that to you. Now faith is the assurance. I'm reading in the Amplified Version. Okay? This is the Amplified Version. Now faith is the assurance. Which is, you know, it says that, that means the confirmation or the title D of the things we hope for being the proof of the things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith, perceiving as real fact, what is not revealed to the senses. When using this definition of faith, we should be able to come up with a whole new vision and purpose for our lives and what we can actually accomplish through faith. You do not have to settle for what life as it is. Because God wants you through faith to come into the fullness of what He has for you. You know what? I remember stumbling with this verse when I was a very young kid. Like, probably a little bit older than these children that uh, we just prayed for. Because I grew up in the Sunday school. Because uh, my My grandparent is a pastor in the Mass Methodist Church. So you can just see there that if you're the pastor, of course, everyone in your family should be in the church every Sunday, right? That's not negotiable. But as a child, it is expected that I have been drilled over and over of Hebrew 11, especially the first verse. And it runs like this. Now faith is the substance of all things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. But I never really understood what that means. For years, I never quite understood this verse. But I just have to memorize it. But when I get older, I read this verse again in the NIV translation. And it says like this. Now faith is being sure of what we hope and certain of what we do not see. Well, that made a little more sense. But still, I have struggles with understanding what that verse really meant. Not until I heard, I read about Hebrews 11, 6. And it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And if you are a Christian, that is supposed to be your only life objective, to please God. And that got me into a whole new different idea about my faith. We love, you know, having faith, you have to admit that having faith does not mean that things will always go your own way, right? And most of the time it's the opposite. And having faith, though, okay, it means that you have the inner strength and decide to go on no matter what. You see what others cannot see. You see what others cannot perceive. And it gives you the energy, that inexplicable power. It gives you the courage that others cannot understand. Sight makes one to tread waters when life is... Oh, that sounded wrong. <laughs> Faith makes one able to tread waters when life difficulties seems to be overwhelming. And you know what? This is what really happened in, in, in Mark chapter 5. You know the story about that woman who has... She's been... Uh, something with the 
blood disorder, bleeding for almost 12 years, right? We have some doctors here. Imagine what will happen to a person if you've been bleeding uh, for 12 years. You probably there. Is that possible? Or you will not bleeding. Uh, you will be unhealthy, right? You know, this lady has a bleeding uh, disorder for 12 years, okay? And probably she got to so many doctors, spent all her money, tried everything that she could uh, do just to get well and be cured. But nothing helped her. So she continued to walk her way going downhill until one day doing that she heard this commotion oh somebody's famous okay somebody famous is in town and it so happened that Jesus is passing by so she heard the stories about this person or this person I heard that he healed the blind made him see he made the people walk. Okay? And I also heard that uh, some people who are already dead or about to die, he, he made them well. But this guy was this someone. So because of that, man, she developed this, this uh, courage. Okay? She, 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 she had hope. When life is not fair before, she, she had this sense of, man, <coughs> this could be it. This could be the, the, the cure that I've been waiting for. And then she said to herself, you know what? If I can get to Jesus and touch the fringe of his robe, then I know I will be healed. But the problem is, there is a great multitude of crowd. Okay? It's just hard to get near Jesus because he's crowded with the multitude of number of people. So that became a problem. Thousands of people are gathered. They're all packed in. And it seems impossible for her to get near to Jesus. So you know what she did? You know what? She, she found her way through the crowd. She said, you know what? Excuse me. Let me just go, go to that person. You know what? I, I've been bleeding all my life life for 12 years, I just need to get, go to the front and then he bounce people here and there just to get here Jesus. And you see what these people told me, you know what, what is this lady doing? That's your problem, you know what? Just wait in line. Take your turn. But nothing can stop her. She's on a mission. She made up her mind. But I'm sure she was weak. Because she had lost blood for years. She didn't feel like it, but she had to fight her way through the crowd. Well, I can imagine that, you know what, it's very exhausting. It's natural. And she, she finally fell in the ground doing that and had to crawl. And at the last few feet, all that she could do is to reach out the fringe of Jesus Christ's robe. And you see what happened? Jesus said, who touched me? And his disciples stopped and said, what do you mean who touched you? There's so many people here. How can we tell you who touched you? Everybody's touching you. And Jesus said, no. Somebody touched me and I can feel that a miracle working power just drew out of me because somebody touched me. And about that time, Jesus saw this woman and Jesus looked at her eye and when their eyes met she was afraid but Jesus said there's nothing wrong and she said he said daughter your faith has made you whole go in peace in your head take note that the key here is the faith I'm sure that woman has, well, right? they're probably praying that she will get healed someday. She has friends trying to encourage her, oh, you know what, you will get healed. Just keep doing what you're doing. Oh, 
probably she has neighbors that were trying to encourage her. But those are all good. Don't get me wrong. But there's nothing more powerful if you have faith. When you believe, you expect things to change. When you keep saying to yourself, I know that God is still God. He's in control. My breakthrough is coming. I know healing is on the way. I know the right person will come into my future. I know God has started this and He will finish it. You know what? Your faith can cause your Creator, the Creator of the universe to go work and take notice of you. That activates God's power. You know, brothers and sisters, I know that there were other people, or even among us, who are in the same situation, so to speak. You have needs. You have doubts. But the problem is, they just bump into Jesus. And nothing happened. But this lady touched him. The issue here is that if you are just brushing up against him, or you are just touching him casually, okay, without that expectancy of getting healed, just like this woman, I don't think anything like this would happen. But be like this woman. Take notice that Jesus is passing through. God is passing by and He has all the power. Don't just brush up against Him. Don't be passive and think that He could never accomplish anything in your life. But do like this lady. Reach out and touch Him. Release your faith and believe that this will happen. So what am I saying here? You know, what I'm trying to say is that some of you, maybe at this point, is about to give up on your job. It's too, too hard, man. I was in that situation a long time ago. Because I'm doing a job that's too strange to me. Uh, have you ever find yourself in, in, in a situation where probably kids like a few years older than the, the children we have here, uh, they never even respect you? Okay. You see, uh, I was, uh, my, my only job here in the U.S. is, is that's the only job that I, I, I'm a teacher. My first job is a uh, uh, seventh grade teacher in, in El Paso. And, uh, and, my, and my students, uh, they, they're the ones running my, my classroom. They don't listen to me. They disrespect me. Uh, they treat me lower than their peers that they, they bully on, just like that. And uh, I, I call my wife every day. I spend one hour on the phone. And I told her, I want to go home. And she said, you go home, what will you do? So I went to, to the Emmanuel Baptist Church. Our pastor, I met Pastor Rich there. So every, every day he will call me on the phone, pray for me, and then he will sing me those uh, hymns. And that what got me through. There were days that I am taking a shower, that I'm falling asleep in the shower because of, uh, of that issue that I never want to go to work. You know what, what I do? I pray for each chair. Every, if I'm going to see this class, I pray for each chair. Oh God, please calm this student down. Let, let him, <laughs> things like no. But my wife says, why did you come to the U.S. in the first place? What's our dream? Our dream is to get away with this life that you have now here. Very dirty politics 
is we may never be husband and wife in one year if we still stay here. That's our dream. But Proverbs says, chapter 3, verse 5 and 7, this is actually what Pastor Witness read me the first time he called me. He said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, Him He shall direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. When, when you are in that situation, these things make a lot more sense. Right? This is what Abraham did when God gave him a promise that he would have a child in the natural, which is really impossible. You know why? Because he and his wife Sarah, they were nearly 100 years old. Do you even see someone that age bearing a child at this times uh, that we live in? No, it's, it's impossible. But it says in Romans 4, Paul says there, Abraham did not waver in faith, but he was fully persuaded God would do what he promised. So how could Abraham have this unfavoring way, faith, when all the odds were against him? He's too old for that. I could see him, you know what? There's not even a glimmer of hope there. I can see him saying that. Maybe God is joking. Well, you, you got to do what Abraham did and said. Right? When he said, I'm not going to consider just what my mind and my thoughts are telling me. I'm not going to consider just what the experts are saying. I'm not going to consider the size of my problem. I'm going to consider the size of my God. He spoke the world into existence. That's the kind of God he has. He flung the stars in the space. He's not limited by time, anything in the natural, because he is a supernatural God. And when you consider God in those sense, that is faith. You see, when I reach my teenage year, I never get to really surrender my life to the Lord until I was probably, you know, third year, fourth year in high school. Although I was born in a, a, a Tibet, this faith. And, and, and one Sunday, I learned it from my Sunday school, <coughs> that the Christian life is really a life of faith. And if we are to be successful as Christians, we must learn how to walk in faith. You believe that? Well, I don't really, really understand that. Uh, until my anxiety as a born again Christian turns into lack of anxiety. Have you had that experience? The first time you were born, you were so excited. Everything is like, I can solve every problem in the world, right? That's what, that's what it is. Because you were so excited, you were up. But until my, my excitement turns into lack of excitement, or it turns into worries, it turns into problems and difficulties, that's the only time I really understand about faith. And then it came back to me in Hebrews 11, 6, that the only way to peace God is through our faith. And having faith, it guarantees that things are not always going in your own way. You believe that? Having faith, though, means that you will have the inner strength and decide to go on no matter what life circumstances you are in. If having faith is the only way to please God, then it is imperative that every Christian should learn how to walk in faith. And in order to grow in faith, it must be 
after one or two years, how fast he, he grows. And as we begin to age, we will, you know what? What do we do when we, we, when we age? We start growing, right? We grow this way, right? <laughs> so, so you start watching your eating, right? You go to the gym, you preserve your energy because your body is not the same anymore. I remember when, when I was in my early years, when I met my wife, she, she said, you know what, that, that time I met you, your, your waistline is only 24. I was in my early, in mid-20s. And then, I go to her house, I eat like a, like a what? A bull, right? I just eat, I eat like a, a <laughs> serve me rice, a little bit, I take that. And nothing happening, and she will ask me, where did you put all those food? <laughs> my metabolism is so fast and all that. But you see, now I'm in my late 40s, and she was telling me that last Sunday, and I told her, I, I just ate one, one small cup of rice every day. Sometimes I skip it, but I still didn't win. <laughs> but do you think I've been eating too much? You see, last year my doctor, uh, I, I go to Dr. K every year for my, my physical check. And he said, oh man, you, you're a bad guy. What? You gain weight. And your sugar is so elevated. If I see you like this this year, I'm going to give you that uh, medicine. And then I went home, my wife is so mad. And she was like, because I told you, stop eating those chips and stop drinking those sodas. And then she, to make her case, she said, you see, here's this uh, article in the internet from, who's this famous doctor? Read it. Remember I showed you, read it, and then I read it one time, and then she was making me read it again. Okay, read it, and I read, I read it. Yeah, yeah, I got you. And because I, I, I love my wife, I told her, okay, I promise you, from now on, I promise you, I will never read again. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> in today's message, although it's not inclusive, we have identified five great exercises to live by so we can grow in faith. One is, you have to get a, a, a picture of what God has in store for you. Which means that, you know, once you've got that faith picture of what you see God is doing in your life, whether it's in your marriage, in, in your discipline, planning of your children, relationship, finance, whatever. Okay? Get a, a, a good picture of that. Second one is begin to confess to one another the things you see God doing. And this means whatever God is doing in your lives daily, you must confess these things to one another. Meaning, make your faith your declarations. Third one is, we need to have the understanding that faith comes by finding the biblical solution, not somewhere else. It means that you go to the Bible study, read your Bible, memorize the Word, meditate on it, and we have to really stand on the Word, not on something else. Number four, we need to understand that your faith picture must be put into action. That is what we say. That's where in Christianity, that's where the rubber meets the road. In Christianity, so to speak. In James 2, the scripture says, If someone says he has faith but does not have work, can faith save him? And to jump. Thus, also faith by itself. If it does not have work, it's what? Death. Faith without work is death. Number five. After all these faith exercises and calisthenics have been said and done, our thinking is, 
things are postures, we expect that things will what? Start to change, right? At this point, change is inevitable. But faith is knowing the one whom you trust. And that knowledge should not only inspire us to work towards what is seen, but most importantly, towards what is unseen. If we are to fulfill God's will for our lives, as the Apostle Paul says, and countless of other biblical heroes of our Bible did in their lifetime, and those lifetimes are not always sweet and rosy. We have to do like them. This is what happened to Abraham when God asked him to sacrifice his son. It also happened to Jacob when he lost everything including his health. I mean to Job. It also happened to Noah when he was asked to build the ark. It happened to Joseph when he was thrown into prison. Happened to Moses when he led God's children across the Red Sea. Happened to Joshua when he hauled. He was told to circle Jericho for seven days. What an odd way to conquer Jericho. It happened to Daniel when he was thrown into the den of Lyle. It happened to Stephen when he was stoned to death. And it also happens to you, to me, to all of us. But notice that what I have enumerated, <coughs> there is only one thing that's common, right? And if you try to study each of these individuals' life testimonies of faith, you can only see one thing that's common. There is a common ground there, and that is what? Obedience. To say of you, Abraham was obedient to God when he was told to sacrifice his son. Genesis 2, Moses was obedient and submissive to God when he was told to stretch out the rod over that sea and it parted it. And Joshua was obedient to God when he was told to circle Jericho seven times and you will conquer the whole city. No general will, 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 will consider that as a same war strategy to conquer an enemy. It's absurd. But folks, the crux of the problem is, we may not like it, but having faith does not mean that things are going your way all the time. Worshiping God doesn't mean that there will not be wilderness moments. There are many of those. Or even wilderness years, not just moments. Faith in these instances will keep us sane, focused, and comforted that in spite of these dire circumstances, we will get through. Have you ever been to Disneyland, the happiest place in the world? I've been there several times. Man, I'm always happy whenever I go there. Even happier than my own kids. But I had the scariest elevator ride of my life when our friend Ronald he said go ride that hotel California there oh it's easy have you been there the scary hotel man it's a, it's a top and then you see those there and I thought I, I lost my breath they told me why did you say it's easy that that almost killed me <laughs> You see, faith is like that, brothers and sisters. It means having to trust God, whatever that looks like, or however it is manifested. Having faith, it means that we have to, even if I elevate in 1,000 floor high elevator, or if I ride an airplane, if you have fear of heights, having faith is like that. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And because we love God, we want to please God. And because we love God, we have to keep on pressing on, pressing forward in, in spite of the obstacle. You see, there's a reason why the windshield is so big, right? And the rear view mirror is so small. You know the reason for that? Because when you drive, you don't look at the box. You look at the rear view. There's a much bigger Bigger picture. Picture. You see, husband, did you still remember the first time you were courting your wife? I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, and you're in trouble. You see, when you ask your wife the first time, if it's a yes or no, you know what they tell you, especially for a woman 
they, they tell you me. So you have to keep on pressing on until you get that unconditional yes. And because I love my God, because I love her so much, no, 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 that, that sounded wrong. Because I love my God, not my God. I have to keep on pressing on to get that yes, right? So, you remember Michael Jordan in 1997 during that championship game against the against Utah Jazz when he's playing with blue light symptoms. Did he sit on the bench? No. He stayed on the game and he scored 38 points. Just like what Jordan did, even if you are suffering with blue light symptoms, things are not feeling too good. You're you're in bad shape. God wants you to stay in the game. It's easy to stay in the game if you are healthy, not injured and all that. But faith is staying in the game. And this is how Prophet Isaiah did it. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Isaiah 61. It says here, Arise! From spiritual depression to a new life. There's a song for that, right? Arise, child. For your God is God, and the glory of the Lord is risen. When God sees you in the day, in pain and all, in bandage and all, and when you show up with that kind of attitude, even if you're hurting, Lord is pleased with your faith. God is pleased with that kind of faith. Let me end my sermon here. If I can write a prescription of how our life as a Christian should be lived, I will say it like this. Yesterday is a canceled check. We cannot negotiate it again. Tomorrow is a promissory note. It can be utilized until it arrives. Today is your cash in hand. You have to invest it. I am convinced that God is calling you to be all out for Him. Invest your life to Him. This is your present. Our present calls for the time for us to reach that new levels of faith. But the question is, where are you now? Have you been at the same place before 10 years ago? If so, God may be calling you to take a greater step of faith to a new experience of freshness in your walk with Him. Submit to His authority in the spirit of worship and adoration and be fully convinced of what He wants to do in your life. Keep pressing on in spite of all the obstacles and you shall experience the result